Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel for my roundup of the best books I have read in 2021 so far. So I always like to check in midway through the year, as many of us do, with what books I have truly enjoyed the most, what books stand out from the first six months of reading for me and what I just want to recommend time and time again. So this is a great opportunity for me to do that. But it's also fun come the end of the year to look back when I round up my favourites of the entire year and see what stuck around and maybe what got booted off the list because something even more incredible uh, made the cut. But even if one of these books doesn't end up on my best books at the end of the year, you can know for certain that I still truly love them all and would highly recommend them all because otherwise they wouldn't be on my best books of the first half of the year list. So without further ado, let's get into the best books I personally have read in the first half of 2021. These are in no particular order, so I'm just going to go through them in the order that I literally remembered and wrote them down on my list, starting with we Have Always Been Here, a queer Muslim memoir by Samra Habib. So this is a non-fiction title, it's one of two non-fiction books to have made it onto this list so far this year and it's just one that I was so entirely involved and absorbed in throughout the listening experience because I did listen to it on audiobook and I consumed so quickly. It's probably one of the books on this list that I read the quickest because I just felt so like I said, involved and attached to the life of the uh, narrator and the writer, author, memoirist who this is all about because this is Samra Habib's, like I said, memoir about her own experiences as a queer Muslim woman and it goes all the way back to her childhood and explores her experiences um, moving from Pakistan to Canada, the different gender dynamics within her family itself, the marriage that is arranged for her while she's still a teenager, the pro process of leaving that marriage and also discovering who she truly is in her own sexuality and her gender expression and just the way that she lives her life both as a Muslim and as a queer person and finding the overlap in those identities. Though she definitely goes for a period where there's some distance between her and the religion that she grew up with but then um, she is able to find others who are also queer and Muslim and this community and that's sort of where the title comes from we have always been here that she is not alone the queer Muslim community exists and they are out there living their lives and finding ways to have their voices heard and that's something that she has continued to do um, through her own work because she is both a photographer, a writer, a journalist, a creative that has taken this project on herself both because of her own identity and also for those who don't feel as comfortable speaking up and who don't have a platform in the way that she does. And she just tells of her life in a very, like I said, involving way. You feel very, very much as if you're welcomed into her journey and it has its difficult moments. And it's really, really interesting to listen to or to read and really eye-opening. And I really, really appreciated her perspective because it's not one I've read a lot in non-fiction or fiction. And it's nice to see it out there and it's nice to see it explore and the different ups and downs of that journey and I particularly loved reading about her as she got older and was able to explore this queer side of herself and I found that just really empowering to read about. So I, I love this story. I always love listening to memoirs on audiobook because they do have that feel of you're listening to the voice of the person and it's like they're telling you about their life. It feels very intimate so I would recommend that although of course I'm sure the book is equally as phenomenal and I do have a physical copy which I ended up highlighting some passages in that when I heard them I thought were so beautiful that I wanted to sort of mark down for myself things about found family etc which is something that I myself think is incredibly important um, and, and, and love and care about so it was nice to read about. So yes, I absolutely love this memoir, I would highly, highly recommend it. Whilst we're on the topic of non-fiction I guess I'll just talk about the second non-fiction on this list which is Pain and Prejudice. A Call to Arms for Women and Their Bodies by Gabrielle Jackson. So this is a non-fiction book that explores the medical industry because it is an industry in lots of ways, uh, the medical profession, medical treatment and specifically how it has let down women throughout the years. Uh, this book does acknowledge that the exploration it is focusing on is the sort of treatment of cis women and uh, those who aren't women and those whose bodies I guess were traditionally considered feminine, although perhaps are not 
women. She definitely doesn't dismiss trans and non-binary identities in this book. I think what she's just getting at is the fact that a lot of the reason that uh, women's pain is dismissed in the medical profession is because it's associated with women traditionally in the way that you think of uh, more old-fashioned diseases like hysteria. That's something that I think uh, we're all sort of familiar with in like a, a larger or smaller sense. That idea that uh, women who acted outside of the norms for women in society a uh, hundred, two hundred years ago were considered hysterics and could be locked up or have forceful hysterectomies and it was truly horrific. But still today there is um, a presence of that same attitude in which women are often overlooked in medical professions for their symptoms. Physical symptoms are dismissed as emotional and those uh, conditions that present in women differently from men haven't had the same degree of research. Things like endometriosis are still incredibly difficult to get diagnosed. Not to mention that women are more likely to experience chronic pain throughout their life and those same chronic pain conditions that women experience, again, less researched, less well-funded research than a lot of conditions that are traditionally associated with men, for example. So it's really, really interesting interesting and I think it's really empowering as a woman or somebody with a body that is generally dismissed by the medical profession because I think this book could actually be really empowering to just anybody who has felt that their pain has been dismissed by medicine um, regardless of who they are and how they identify. It's a really really incredible book. It has chapters dedicated to period symptoms, it has chapters dedicated to the menopause and really makes you um, sort of face up to some of your misconceptions and your preconceptions conceptions that are still sort of perpetuated today and are being sort of challenged by those outside of the medical profession and some within the medical profession who are looking for them to be sort of better researched, better diagnosed, better treated, like endometriosis. I think that's like a perfect example of it, but it's not the sole offender here. It definitely is not. This is part of something much wider and it's part of sexism that has permeated into the medical profession. Such an informative book, so much research and information within it. I found it so fascinating and again, I listen to it on audiobook, but it's not one I own in physical copy and I really want to pick up in physical copy. I really want to pick up in physical copy because it's one I think I'll return to and would like to reread sections on um, for myself and for my own empowerment um, and also to discuss with friends and family. So I'm probably going to pick that up. I thought it was genuinely incredible. Moving on to fiction, I have one middle grade title on this list and that is Hollow Pox by Jessica Townsend. This is book three in the Trials of Morrigan Crow series. So I can't go into terrible amounts of detail of about the plot specifically in this book because obviously that would give away spoilers for books one and two but I'll give you a general overview about what this series is about and then some of the things more broadly that I really enjoyed about book three. This is a series that's just consistently gotten better and better for me. I think I gave book one four stars but then books two and three have both received five stars for me. Absolutely adored them. And this is a middle grade series. I would also say if you're an adult who doesn't tend towards reading middle grade now, even though you did when you were a child, and who enjoys fantasy, this really stands out as something that can be enjoyed by all ages. It's got so many complexities. I think it has a lot of the joy and the escapism that we loved when we were children, um, but still is captivating enough and um, interesting enough, say, for an adult. So definitely check it out. This is about Morrigan Crow, who is a little girl that's cursed to die on her 11th birthday, but is instead stolen away. She's whisked away to the world of Nevermore, where she's invited to participate in the trials to uh, become a member of the... Um, to become a member of the Wondrous Society, who are those within the realms of their world that have special abilities. She has no idea why she's been picked, she doesn't know what her special ability is, and we find that out during book one. Now, the things that I love about book three are, again, these sort of darker tones. I felt like these came through in book two, more so than in book one, where the Jessica Townsend can write a really creepy scene. She can create a really creepy atmosphere, and I love it. I love that in middle grade. Um, I think it's done in a way that's entirely appropriate for children, um, but I also just think it's so eerie and atmospheric and absorbing. I, I love it. I love the way she writes. Um, and I also love the way that Morrigan's relationships with um, those that she has made her found family in Nevermore and also her friends have developed in this book. I love seeing the different sort of dynamics between all those relationships and friendships and both the love and the care within those relationships but also the moments of tension that arise. And I really, really enjoyed it. I love the way that the plot is carrying 
carrying on for books one and two and I can't wait to carry on with the series which I think is going to be quite a long one, maybe eight books or something like that but I'm not complaining. From children's book, from, from children's fantasy to adult thrillers however, the next book on my list is A Madness of Sunshine by Nalini Singh. So this is one of my favourite th thrillers I've read in a while and I think that's because of the atmosphere. I think this book, while still being a really compelling mystery, also has something to offer in terms of setting and atmosphere and just beautiful prose writing and that's not to say that thrillers are not well written but I don't find they often focus on the like sort of individual beauty of words and sentences that Nalini Singh does in the way that Nalini Singh does in, in her book and that's how she brings the setting to life is set in rural New Zealand and the landscape descriptions are so detailed. I feel like I'm there. It made me want to travel to rural New Zealand even though the book was also about a missing girl and murders and dark thriller themes. <laughs> as long as that doesn't happen while I'm there, like I'm, I'm, I'm down with it because it just felt so absorbed. It really sort of brought the whole story to life by giving it this very very real setting and it's about a woman from this rural New Zealand community who left years and years ago after her mother died in an accident uh, but now her husband has died so she's a widow and she decides to move back to her hometown where she always said she would never come back to and not long after she arrives back there a young girl goes missing. Now we then follow both her perspective and the perspective of the local police officer who's an outsider that's moved into this community and they end up building a relationship between them. Nalini Singh also writes romance so there are romantic themes in this book although it's not the focus of the story and we follow as they get to know one another and also investigate the mystery of this missing girl. The female protagonist is able to provide all this detail about the community because she is an insider and obviously the police officer being involved because he's a police officer so that's why he has to solve the mystery but I really really enjoyed this one and can't wait to read more by Nalini Singh. Continuing with the slightly darker novels we then have Madam by Phoebe Wynn. This is a modern day gothic although it's actually set in the 90s but it's a novel that only just came out this past year. It's set in 1992 at an all girls boarding school in rural Scotland for the elite of the elite. For, for the daughters of the richest and most elite members of British society in the 1990s. <laughs> and we follow a young classics teacher. So this is her first time working at a private school, at a boarding school, but she gets offered this job which has excellent pay, the school has an excellent reputation, so it's impossible really to turn it down, especially with her responsible for her mother's upkeep in a care home down in England. So she moves up to this boarding school in order to take on her new role, but it is quite unlike any teaching position she's ever had before in terms of the students. These students are not like those she has taught in the past, and it seems that they know more about their lives there than even she does as a teacher. They hold this authority, this secret understanding of why they're at this school and what this school's true purpose is because all is not as it seems and there are secrets around every corner that our new teacher is not privy to but of course they start to unfold as she spends more time there and it takes that traditional gothic narrative of a young woman taken to a sort of dark remote manor house, although in this case we have the boarding school setting full of secrets and um, sort of dark mysteries and her being the sort of naive character who knows absolutely nothing and is flung into this environment and it's a really really interesting take on that genre, that traditional genre that explores themes of feminism and classism and I really really enjoyed it. Plus because she is a classics teacher there's also a ton of references to Greek mythology and ancient Greek and Roman history which I adored, it just added this whole other layer to the story for me and I thought it was incredibly compelling, I just couldn't put it down and I was absolutely turning those pages to get to the end and find out how things concluded. If you'd rather, if you'd rather steer away from the darker novels however, I also have on this list a good old Regency historical romance because I'm a sucker for this genre and that is Rules for an Unmarried Lady by Wilma Counts. Now what struck me about this historical romance in particular is its exploration of grief and family and support and the balance between doing what you think is right but also listening to others needs in that grieving post-death scenario and I love the way it handled the familial relationships and the care that all the characters show for one another. I thought that was something that really stood out in this book in a way that I haven't seen focused on in other historical romances before 
before. But the premise is that we have two protagonists. We have a man and a woman from aristocratic Regency society whose brother and sister have recently passed away. They were married. So this brother and sister have died in an accident, leaving behind their large brood of children parentless. So their aunt and their uncle, the brother and the sister of the two dead parents, come to the home in which these children have grown up and act as their guardians. Now they butt heads in their approach to sort of parenting in this scenario, in their approach to grieving. The older children are really reticent to leave home and go off to school and leave behind their siblings after just losing their parents, but the uh, uncle believes it's what's best for them, whereas the aunt feels that they should be allowed to stay at home and that's one of their sort of bones of contention. But at the same time, they have so much respect for one another and are able to sort of grow as people and do what is best for these children as a duo, which naturally leads to them falling in love and it's adorable. It's a lovely, lovely romance about two people coming together in a very dark situation um, but able to sort of make a new family and find a way to support these children and find happiness and love with one another against all the odds. I really, really enjoyed it. Um, it was just like a book of warm, fuzzy feelings and like that's exactly what you want sometimes. From historical romance to contemporary romance, however, the next book on this list is The Flat Share by Beth O'Leary. So this is a book that had quite the hype maybe last year or the year before I've lost track of time, years, uh, decades, all of it. Um, but I've been meaning to read it since it came out and I'm really pleased with how I fared with it because I was a bit nervous going in given all the hype. And I also don't read a ton of contemporary romances. I prefer my fantasy and historical romances but this one really proved to me that there is a book in every genre for me. I read it for the book club that my uni friends and I do together as a way to stay in touch um, and Zoom call with one another once a month by reading and wrapping up a book then blathering about other stuff of course. And there was mixed reactions. We had those that just thought it was meh and then we had those that loved it like me but it's obviously the right book for some people not the right book for other people but if you do think it sounds like your cup of tea then definitely check it out. It's about a young man and a young woman living in London. One of of whom is staying in this London flat and needs a bit of extra cash and the other of whom needs to get out of her ex-boyfriend's home and find somewhere cheap to stay because she doesn't earn a lot as she works in publishing <laughs> which is not a very highly paid industry and I can definitely concur with that as someone who has worked in publishing and who still works in publishing in a freelance capacity. <laughs> the creative industries, right? <laughs> um, but the solution that they end up coming to is a flat share to the extent where they are actually sharing the same room because Leon, our male protagonist, is a night nurse at a hospice so he isn't there during the evenings or the nights whereas Tiffy our female protagonist like I already mentioned works in publishing so she only needs a flat at night time when Leon's away so they literally split the bed 50-50 and at first they never meet so for quite some time as flatmates effectively they do not ever see each other in person but leave each other these notes and get to know one another through these notes they perhaps do a little bit of baking and leave it behind for the other one or a little bit of cooking and they build up this really positive friendship that then turns into a romance. Now, this scenario is ludicrous. Moving in and sharing a flat with someone you've never met, where you share the same room, seems a little bit on the dangerous side, although it's excusable given how expensive London rent is, but that is romance. Like, romance novels often create slightly ludicrous, slightly out there scenarios in order to create these fun dynamics and I can forgive it for being slightly out there and slightly unrealistic in terms of the living situation because the characters are so wonderful. I loved getting to know them, I loved following their developing friendship, then subsequent romance, um, and also their lives and careers outside of this romance because there's a lot to this book that I wasn't expecting. For example, Leon's brother is currently in prison and is trying to appeal against Against his sentence because he has been wrongly convicted and that was a really really interesting side plot. We then also have the fact that Tiffany has gotten out of a abusive relationship very recently at the beginning of this novel and it's a relationship that she didn't really realise was abusive until it ended and I thought that the way in which you see Tiffy come to terms with the abuse that was a part of her relationship that she was in on and off again for years 
really realistic um, and if anybody's just ever been in any sort of toxic relationship that they sort of knew they needed to leave but didn't know why because it was um, more m emotionally abusive than physically abusive then I think they might see themselves in this story. There was definitely moments that I found myself relating to in terms of like sort of past relationships that I've had although they didn't go on as long as Tiffy's did with her partner and I loved seeing her journey and her choices to go to therapy and explore all of that and it was incredible character growth and I loved everything about it. This book really surprised me in its complexity. Then last but not least for this video I have a poetry collection and that is And Then She Ate Him by Tom Denby. This is one of my favourite poetry collections that I've read in a long time and it was by a poet who I hadn't read previously um, so it was a real discovery for me and I cannot wait to read more by Tom Denby in the future, read more of his poetry. I'm really hoping that he'll bring out another collection because these were spectacular. They contained so much like wit and humour as well as commentary on modern society, on homophobia, on sort of gender discrimination and it was truly incredible what he accomplished with these little vignettes, these little stories within these poems. I love them. Plus there are tons of references to mythology and fairy tales, like he uses the tropes of these fairy tales slash myths in order to sort of comment on modern society and discrimination and the fetishization of um, the LGBT community and it's just such clever writing, such absorbing rhythmic poems that I found myself rereading and reading aloud to my partner because I just wanted to share them. They made me laugh but they also made me laugh in a way that I was just thinking how does this happen? This is not okay but you have made these incredibly poignant observations about things that go on around us and I was just like oh my god. <laughs> I loved them. I thought they were so creative and like I said, one of my favourite poetry collections that I have read in quite some time. So those are the best books I've read in the first six months of 2021. I always love to see, I also always love to see how different everything is, that amongst everything I read I end up with favourites from the non-fiction genre, from the poetry genre, from the middle grade, from the adult, from the fantasy, from the contemporary. It's a lot of fun and it just goes to show that there are wonderful books out there in every genre. So do let me know what the best books you've read are in the first half of the year, what books stand out from you from the past six months that you would highly, highly recommend and also if you've read any of these books and want to chat about them, even if you didn't like them, that's okay. But until next time happy reading and I'll see you all again soon. Bye everyone!